We now are reading from Colossians chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the, supre the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hear the word of the Lord. Uh, many of us will recognize this, some of us may not recognize this, but this is Ottawa, uh, where I grew up. And when I was about 10 or 11 years old, uh, when we were living in Ottawa, my mom began volunteering with an organization called Pollution Probe. This was a nonprofit dedicated to investigating and fighting uh, pollution, all kinds of pollution. So this was about 50 years ago back in the early 70s. And I remember my mom explaining to me the purpose of this organization. And I very clearly remember thinking, well, that seems kind of pointless. I don't see a problem with pollution. In the sense of, like, I, I'm not seeing it around me. So I find it really weird that today, 50 years later, I would remember that little thought as a kid. I also find it weird that I was so, I, I, I was so confident in my ignorance. <laughs> you know, um, my response was based on total ignorance. I had no understanding of the situation. I had no ability to project where the world would be 50 years from then. You know, I had no understanding of God's mandate to us as humanity to care for creation. Unfortunately, too many adults today have the same attitude that I had when I was a boy. Today, I'm continuing my series on five aspects of humanity, which Christian tradition says are created in the image of God. So here are some of the previous, uh, well, here are the previous three that I've covered so far in this series. Creativity. Our creativity being made in the image of God's creativity. Likewise, our relationality, a bit of an awkward word, but meaning our capacity for relationships, and especially for ag 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 agapic or loving relationships of self-sacrifice. But our relationship, our relationship capacity reflects God's own Trinitarian, internal Trinitarian relationships in nature. And then thirdly, so far in the series, is rationality. Our capacity for reason reflecting God's capacity for reason. So when we look at the universe, we see perhaps what looks like a lot of chaos, but there's a lot of order underneath there. And that order reflects an ordered mind that created it, a, a mind of rationality and reason. And so our capacity for reason reflects God's own rational nature as well. So that's what we've looked at so far. Creativity, relationality, and rationality in the image of God. And so today, I'm going to address the next in this series, which is responsibility. But actually not responsibility in general, but biblically, responsibility for, of a particular type. And that is responsibility for the natural world. This is, in fact, the very first theme in Scripture associated with being made in the image of God, back in Genesis chapter 1. So this is responsibility for our world. So today is really, what I'm saying today is really a continuation of Julia's team sermon 
a few weeks ago that she did along with, uh, with Sarah and Judy and Paul. But I'm going to add some more comments today uh, from the image of God perspective or angle on it. And so I'm going to begin by repeating, refreshing our memories, a few comments I made in the first, in my, in my opening sermon in this series. And the whole image of God idea begins back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28. So I'm going to read these words. Let us make mankind, so this is God saying this, right? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, and over the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so the image here is to rule. As God rules the universe, God delegates this divine rule over earth to humans. Now, the meaning of rule here is not really described, not really given. We have to unpack it from the rest of Scripture. So from Genesis 2, it implies, part of this rule implies naming creatures. We do, and so, and as we continue elsewhere through this, through the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, we also know that out of the 613 laws in the Torah, several are about proper care of one's animals, one's own animals, farm animals, in effect. Um, and and so uh, this ruling seems to imply some form of proper care, and those rules are around you know proper feeding and not abusing and so forth. So, for us today, though, this word rule comes with very negative connotations, doesn't it? Because we live on this side of the Industrial Revolution, which for the past couple hundred years has enabled humanity to exploit and abuse and pollute our planet. And so this text from Genesis has indeed been used through history, to justify environmental abuse. As if we can do with nature whatever we want. But the problem is that this kind of self-interested interpretation of Genesis 1, those verses, fails to pay attention to the whole text because of it does indicate that, it explicitly states, that we are to rule in a particular way. That is, in the image of God. And so that does change things. In in the image, is is, uh, an ancient Near Eastern way, not just a Hebrew way, but an ancient Near Eastern way of saying to represent the interests of the gods or of the God. And so this is a concept that's widely understood in the culture. So in the Hebrew scriptures, that comes to be focused on to represent the interests of God. Okay. So, how do we do this? How do we represent God's image, um, God's interests when it comes to creation? Well, as Christians, we read the, the Older Testament through the New Testament. And so, for instance, we see in Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the talents. So let me give you a quick version, short version of this. Short version is that a landowner goes away on a trip, puts his three senior servants, three senior staff in charge of the property, and their job is to ensure the continuing growth and well-being of the, of the owner's property. Two of the three succeed at this mandated responsibility. One of the three does not. So the two that succeed in fulfilling the owner's mandate to them and and command, they get rewarded. The third who fails to live up to the mandate, is uh, he's punished. He suffers punishment. In fact, he has his delegated responsibility removed. In effect, he's he's demoted. That's his penalty. He's demoted. 
loses his job. Step goes down a level or two. So here are a couple implications from this parable. First is that the servants are given latitude in how to use their own judgment in their responsibility for uh, stewarding, caring for the owner's property while the owner's away. So they're given latitude by the owner. You know, I'm leaving you guys with some judgment. Here's the big picture. Here's what I want to see when I come back. <clears throat> but you figure out how that's going to happen while I'm gone. So they're given latitude and judgments on how to fulfill that responsibility. Second, within that latitude is certainly not acceptable to harm the owner's property. So we need to read this word rule in Genesis 1 in this way, I would suggest. <clears throat> rule, when we read that, does not mean to just do as you want. It means that we are delegated by God to care for the natural world, including latitude for judgments for how we care for it. So using our own judgment. But so long as the owner's property, our planet, is not ultimately harmed. We've got a short-form word for this today. We use the phrase creation care. The other part of this image theme in Genesis is that men and women, male and female, together bear the image of God. And so that means that this responsibility is the responsibility of all people everywhere to share this responsibilities. Okay, now, this way of imaging God as caring for creation has taken on, uh, let's say, new and more profound meaning since the Industrial Revolution, right? The invention of, of the uh, internal combustion engine and the creation of plastic. Those two inventions alone uh, have caused so much harm to our world. So when my mom joined Pollution Probe and their activities to protect the environment, my mom and her you know, colleagues, other members of the organization, they were actually fulfilling their God-given mandate to image God in this way. They were fulfilling the divine image. They didn't think of it that way, especially if they had members who weren't religious. It wasn't a religious organization. So even though they didn't think of it that way, from a Jewish and Christian perspective, that's what they were doing, fulfilling their image of God. What about us here at CMP? What about us? Oh. Ah, I added a couple slides that clearly did not update. So, uh, <clears throat> two things I'll, I'll, I will say here. Oh, I know. I forgot to put them in. That's right. <laughs> I, I created them like 20 minutes before the service. I forgot to add them just before the service. Oh, well, I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations. I'll show them next Sunday or something. So, uh, for us here at CMP, a couple of months ago, uh, a number of CMP members participated in a really good online event by uh, climate scientist uh, and, and Christian Catherine uh, Hayhoe uh, just on human-caused climate warming. And I'm going to put the link to the uh, recorded video in the Pulse this week. Just really encourage people to uh, view that sometime. You have uh, 45 minutes or so. Really full of, uh, of really useful information uh, in there. Uh, so I'll put that link in the polls. Uh, more than this, Julia's group has developed uh, a creation care covenant for CMP. And this past week, just this past week, the parish leadership team approved this covenant for CMP. This is the outcome of a year of process of discussions, uh, a group of CMP members who have met together and, uh, and, uh, and put this together under Julia's leadership. And so we will be rolling this out in the fall. So you'll be hearing more about this uh, come September. Regardless, when you and I do something as small as planting pollinators or recycling items, or when we make a decision 
to not purchase, I don't know, for instance, certain items like disposable clothing or bottled water or 10,000 small and big decisions to care for our planet. We are exercising our image of God responsibility, a vocation which God has called us to 3,000 years ago through the ancient Hebrews. This vocation, this responsibility is so important that it's right there in the very first chapter of the Bible. And somehow we've just kind of overlooked that so easily, right there in chapter one of the Bible. Creation care with creativity and responsibility is our God-given vocation, a lifetime calling for all of us. So that's what I want to say this morning, and we're going to open up the floor now for any comments, um, questions, disagreements. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Chris. Uh, I have a question. It's regarding dominion over, you know, because you said rule, you know, and you gave a de definition for it because dominion means that we decide. And if I think about, uh, you know, extracting the oil, you know, and uh, the shale and all these things, well, we have dominion. So what are, are your comments about that? I uh, so that's where that, um, so that sense of being given scope and latitude for judgments, uh, we make judgments that some are better and some are worse. And some are, I mean, ultimately all our judgments are made, need to be made within the scope of agape love, which is self-service to others. Um, sometimes that, <clears throat> um, there, life becomes gray sometimes. So, you know, sometimes a benefit here is actually going to cause a deficit there or a deficit there is going to cause a benefit there. Uh, but on balance, our responsibility is to uh, <clears throat> not kill the planet. I mean, we're the first, you know, first generation, not first generation, but the first period in human history where we actually, that's an actual cause of concern. And so I think part of what's happened is, is people were not, interested in forecasting the you know, <clears throat> future uh, effects of our, of our behaviors. We as humans were built, our brains are built, we like the short-term reward circuits more than the long-term, uh, <clears throat> paying attention to long-term consequences. And so I think that ruling over in terms of responsibility to protect the owner's creation, you know, the earth, uh, in, uh, an important part of that that often gets under-attended to is projecting what are the possible longer-term effects. Um, and, but we, today we know what many of those longer-term effects are. And so our responsibility, uh, we're still pumping out more carbon dioxide this year than last year, despite all the international agreements and so forth. Why on earth are we pumping out, continue to be pumping out more? Even with all our environmental protection things that are in place now. We're still pumping out more, the data shows. Uh, we're not, as humanity, making the sacrifices we need to to preserve our, our environment, is my, is my view. I think we need to make some pretty significant sacrifices, and I will confess that those are as hard for me as for anyone. I'm not pretending they're you know, easier for me, but um, I, think, I do think that we are not making the sacrifices we need to. Does, does that... Is that anywhere in the neighborhood of your question, Amal? Okay. Hello. Michael. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, dealing with young people uh, on a regular basis, I, I get the sense of doom and gloom from them. And I find that sometimes their approach or their solutions, uh, granted they're not necessarily Christian, but their approach or their solutions are not necessarily aligned with other Christian values, like God said, go forth and multiply. And students are like, wow, we can't have more kids. Uh, the, the planet's maxed out. I'm not going to have kids when I grow up. Like, what, what would you say to that mentality? Um, the idea that doom and gloom, point of no return, and yet, should they be having more kids? Like, I, I just find that there's a balance there. What do you think? So, 
one of the things Catherine Hayhoe does in her presentations, because she's a you know she speaks publicly widely, uh, is she talks about the uh, our hope is um, our hope is ultimately in God, but our hope is in our openness to God working through us. And so, um, uh, what are we doing to, to, to change things? Whether it's plastic, whatever. So, I know that those, whether it's youth, whether it's adults, we can feel overwhelmed by the job. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> A, our ultimate hope is always in God. And I do believe God is the ultimate redeemer. And, uh, and so, but I also believe that, uh, that God works with us. And so when youth, or any of us, it's not just youth, um, any of us are overwhelmed, feeling overwhelmed, uh, that's because there is danger. I believe there is danger. Uh, but we also, our hope is in God, our Redeemer. And we work with God and God's people. And, and anyone who is, is making efforts. And so, um, I mean, that's, that's what I would say. In terms of the question of, uh, do you want children? Um, I, I'm going to distinguish two questions there, because you, um, you named one, go forth and multiply. So here's what I consider an important principle of biblical interpretation. Who was that said to? In Scripture, that was said to the early um, you know, uh, early Hebrews. Well, I think it's legitimate to interpret that as saying, okay, it's happened. Okay, the, the world's pretty full. <clears throat> Is that reason um, not to have children? God gives us that freedom to decide what to do. So <clears throat> God gives us a lot of freedom in our decisions. And um, I don't believe God is calling us to stop having children, but that doesn't mean God's calling everyone to have children. God gives us the freedom. So Paul, I mean, Paul talks about um, one, you know, one person does this and another person does that, and you, you know, have, you have disagreements in your churches and society about this and that. Like, as long as both are doing it to the Lord, give people the freedom to do that to the Lord, unto the Lord. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's my response is there's, God gives us a lot of freedom. And in that freedom, I would connect that to God's ultimate hope. But we also have responsibility. So there's no algorithm in there for what that should look like. God gives us kind of the, God says, here's my vision. Here's my hope. Find your place in that. Trust me, but work with me and each other. Anything else? Last uh, question, comment to Sarah. Up, uh, up here, Sarah Cornett. Bridget. Um, I appreciate the, the the scripture that you brought in from Matthew, uh, um, and how the servant who um, did not uh, make use of his talent. Um, I guess another word for that would be neglect, and um, hmm. or yep. the sin of omission. Neglect, yep. And um, one thing I sometimes struggle with myself, and that I hear as an argument against uh, practices to help the environment, is well, there, there's, uh, for example, recycling. Well, not everything goes to recycling, so why bother? Um, and that can be very discouraging and kind of throw your hands up in the air and just, you know, stop, stop doing that. Um, and I would say part of that latitude, there's so much hope in it because just because we don't get it right the first time doesn't mean we stop trying. And so I really appreciate just the freedom and um, that we have to serve God with excellence, and that means trial and error. That means mm -hmm. keep trying, even if it's, okay, that didn't work. Let's find a new technology or something, something else. And, um, and then uh, the other thought 
um, is that it makes sense that we would, as humans, fail in caring for our world, just like we may fail in caring for our bodies, the temple of God, um, by uh, ignorance or, um, uh, what was the other word? I forget, but... Um, Omission? Yeah, um, and for, you know, sometimes we do things that we don't understand, but that are to our, that harm us. And so uh, whether it's, you know, cholesterol <laughs> or whatever, it makes perfect sense that we would kind of treat the earth that way. It's, it, it's hard to understand because it's to our demise. I mean, we're, we're uh, it's, it's where we live. Why wouldn't we want to care for it? Because it's, you know, we're, we want to live in a, a good and healthy, thriving place. But just like we sometimes neglect ourselves, we, we neglect um, where we live. But um, so those are my thoughts. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. I would you know, agree. Uh, your th comments about um, just persevering. Make you know we try something we risk something it didn't work out we continue to try, and I think part of being people of hope uh, is persevering us as the body of Christ persevering, uh, persevering in the small details. Yes, you know what I think. What is it? Figure thirty percent of what I put into my recycling bin is going to actually be recycled or whatever the per percentage is. Um, okay, that's way less than ideal. I'm still going to recycle. I'm still going to be intentional about getting at least 30% done. And, you know, there's those small-scale stuff. There's the big-scale stuff of, of, of trying to intervene at policy levels, um, <clears throat> I think, at and not just policy levels, consumer levels. I think, um, uh, you know, we, we can be focused on policy, which is really important, but who are the, the people undermining positive policy, uh, how do we address them, which can be us ourselves at times. Uh, so I think as people of hope, we not only believe in a God of hope and a God who redeems, but we are people of hope ourselves in our own practices and in our own attitudes and in our own perseverance and in our own trust and in our own doing this as a community together. And that's why uh, <clears throat> Julia's team has come up with this, uh, this phrase for us, a covenant creation care covenant for us as a community. Um, so thank you for that, for that Sarah. That's, that is really helpful. I invite you to stand then, and we will continue as we affirm our faith in the words of the Philippians Creed. Jesus, though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own.